Direct versus indirect rule, strategies of imperialism. So this is a map showing the uh, difference between the ethnic and national and linguistic boundaries of African states and then those uh, boundaries that were put in place by the Europeans. Uh, so for instance, right here you have modern day Mali. And one of the things you can see is that within Mali, there are multiple ethnic and linguistic groups that don't really make any sense with the European boundaries. Uh, things get really confusing uh, in, uh, say, Nigeria or basically all of West Africa, and then uh, particularly in the Great Lakes region around uh, East Africa, where you can tell that the Europeans just made no effort when they drew their boundaries, these white lines here, to really consider at all what uh, African people uh, did to organize their own geographic space. And so one of the key problems with imperialism was that it stuck together people who basically did not see themselves as part of the same nation, which wasn't uh, a particularly common concept in large parts of Africa to begin with. Um, but also sometimes enemies were put together, friends were separated, tribes were separated, ethnic groups were separated. So there really isn't a lot of logic other than what was handy for white people uh, to the boundaries uh, that were put in place during imperialism. So building off of that map, one of the things you can see uh, is that the Europeans uh, basically made Africa the way they wanted Africa to be and did not pay a lot of attention to the uh, native African peoples of all sorts. So one of the methods that the Europeans used to organize the way that they controlled these states was through something called direct rule. So direct rule is kind of what you probably imagine imperialism actually looks like. You have a bunch of very powerful uh, white people, both militarily, governmentally, and stuff like that who come down and just rule over African people directly. Um, white people give the orders, black people take the orders. That is a, a model that is clear, but it has some definite drawbacks. Um, this is largely, although not universally, the method of imperialism for the French, the German, the Belgians, and the Portuguese in Africa. Um, and there were places where the British, say, and various other people ruled directly, but as a rule of thumb, you can assume that the French and the Germans and the Belgians and the Portuguese were more likely to use direct rule. And so here you have a paternalistic set of European professionals coming down to run the colonies. And what that means is that paternalistic is kind of like fatherly, and it usually has a kind of insulting and, uh, you know, you're looking out for these people. And of course, African people didn't feel that they needed to be looked out for, and they certainly didn't see the Europeans as their fathers. Um, but that was kind of the logic of direct rule, that the Africans were incapable of doing anything, so you needed uh, Europeans to tell them how to do it. Boss white man comes and tells you what to do and how to do it is the logic here. And in all of the direct rule states, um, you also see a pretty heavy attempt to assimilate um, African peoples into European culture. And so that means basically uh, you're trying to make the Africans stop being Africans and become either French or German or Belgian or whatever. Um, so for instance, the French uh, in uh, West Africa, which was their primary region, uh, did a lot of teaching of French history, you know, the French Revolution and Napoleon and all that business. And, you know, African people, of course, were not taught their own history and would be like, I don't really understand, you know, the whole point of European history being taught to us because it's not really our history. And the French were like, but we have the good history, so you have to learn it. Um, and a key part of this and an intentional part of this was that you really did, if you were a direct ruler, want to destroy as much local culture as possible and assimilate those locals. You wanted to turn these people who had a bad culture into French people, for example, who had a better culture. That is literally the way the Europeans saw it that way uh, at this time. And there are, the benefit of this is that you, the European governors, get to take all the credit. So, you know, if the Europeans do something good, and sometimes they did things that were good, even in the process of this whole nightmare of imperialism, but, you know, you built roads, you built hospitals, you build a dam that provides electricity or something like that. Obviously, the Europeans could take credit for that and did. They were like, see, this is why we should run everything, because we do all these great things for you. The problem with direct rule is that you take all the blame. 
So if you are the direct ruler and there are only the Germans ruling or only the French ruling, if things go wrong, then you, the Europeans, are to blame. So direct rule was always good in success, but it became a real problem when uh, local people, African people, saw the weaknesses or the failures or the insufficiency of like school building campaigns, for example, or medical campaigns. Um, and so, you know, you had all the power, but on the other hand, you would then get all the blame if things went wrong. This image is a pretty good example of the problem uh, where you clearly just see some white women uh, being carried across by black people. And it kind of encapsulates the basic concept of direct rule and imperialism in general. Uh, you know, the white people were literally carried by African people. And this would be a picture of obviously people in Africa being taught uh, basically European languages and things like that. Um, you know, and it's a nice effort to build schools and, and actually provide some education. And, um, and they did train uh, African elementary school teachers to teach stuff like that. And, and kids from Africa did go to the Sorbonne and other French universities or to college in Berlin and things like that. Um, but always it was an attempt to replace sort of a uh, culture that the Europeans felt was inferior with what they thought of as their own superior culture. And there's always kind of this white guy in the background uh, running everything because it's his culture being disseminated. This image is interesting because it actually shows a little Norwegian aspect of imperialism, which you don't normally think of the Norwegians or the Swedes or various other people, the Dutch or the Danish, as uh, having imperialism in Africa, but they, but they did. Uh, this is a colorized photo, by the way. Um, but this one also is sort of uh, disturbing because you have this uh, literal child standing above or sitting above these uh, people who clearly he is in charge of or has more power than. And that really goes to the heart of direct rule, this idea of literally you are on top of the Africans and even a child is more important than an African person. And like most forms of imperialism, you also did see uh, an attempt to bring uh, locals, Africans, same kind of thing in Indonesia or Vietnam or India or things like that into the militaries of the Europeans. And generally the way that worked is that these uh, African soldiers would be privates and maybe corporals and sergeants, but the officer corps would always be white. The people giving the orders are always white. Um, the best weapons are always reserved for white people, primarily to avoid a rebellion. Um, the kind of interesting and depressing thing about this sort of uh, situation here is that very often when independence came, it would be these soldiers who would unfortunately often take over the countries. And that's something that can be laid directly at the feet of the Europeans as something that they allowed to be put in place that caused trouble later. Here's an earlier example of uh, African troops working for the Europeans. Uh, these ones would be in a German colony. And here you can really kind of get the sense of the, the mix of African culture, uh, obviously the headgear within European style clothing. And you can also see that the, you know, the weaponry and the, the uniforms are much, much more limited than what Europeans themselves would have received. Here's a map you've probably seen before. This shows the which uh, European countries had which colonies. Um, so you can obviously see uh, that the French controlled West Africa. Weirdly, this map does the unusual thing of making the French red. Usually they're blue. Um, and you can also see all the British colonies. And one of the things you can kind of notice here is that there are just resistance and opposition to European imperialism throughout uh, Africa. Um, and basically, as soon as the Europeans show up in numbers, which is the 1880s, and particularly after they start officially taking over, which is usually in the late 1800s and around 1900, then you almost immediately got uh, resistance all throughout Africa. This is a kind of fun image because it's actually a uh, Nigerian Yoruba uh, statue slash piece of folk art that really kind of shows exactly uh, from the African point of view what Europeans uh, would have seemed like. They uh, you know, basically are running things and they would tour around meeting uh, the people that they uh, were in charge of in indirect rule, which is the next thing I'm gonna talk about. So indirect rule is the second kind of imperialism or form of rule in imperialism that you saw in Africa, also in Asia. Um, but the indirect rule is kind of famously seen as the British model, although the French did do it and sometimes, actually I don't think the Germans did, but uh, 
but definitely the French sometimes did and the British often did. An indirect rule is really, uh, was kind of an accident in a weird way. Um, it came out of British experience in India where the British were very outnumbered and didn't really have dominant military force. So they had to rule indirectly through local leaders. And the British never really did have enough people to honestly run their empire directly. They probably would have, could they have, but, um, but eventually they realized that actually indirect rule relying on existing local leaders did kind of help out um, with what they were trying to do. Um, and basically what the Europeans did in Africa was try and find local leaders who they could um, advance and rule through. Um, and so that might be a particular tribe within one of the colonies that they set up, or it might be a you know particular uh, individual, like a sub chief or the son of the chief, somebody they could find who would be willing to work with the British. Anyone not willing to work with the British would be destroyed. And that might mean killed or exiled, all kinds of ways that you could destroy their power. Um, but basically the idea was that you found people uh, who cooperated and you rewarded them bribe them in other words. And the idea here was that you did have to find people you could control, but they also had to be fairly respectable. Like the British were aware that they needed to find people who the local people, whatever African ethnic group, tribe, whatever, would actually respect and their authority would be listened to. And so it was kind of a tricky game because the British did have to find people who would, they could sell as the rulers, not just as puppets. Um, and the key thing for the British was to make sure that the people they did create as local powers and therefore people they ruled through remained dependent on the British themselves um, instead of being dependent on their own countrymen the way we would think of a ruler being. Um, normally when we think of rulers of places I think hopefully we imagine that those rulers are going to be, you know, ruling in favor of their people or helping their people rule. Even if you're a dictator, sometimes you do good things for your people. Um, the British were okay with people doing well, but they definitely wanted to make sure that the, that the people they put in charge knew who was actually in charge. And that was the British. Um, and they wanted to make sure that the people in charge did rely and care more about British interests than local African interests. This image is kind of handy for understanding what this would have looked like. Um, sorry about the blurry image, but it's an old, old photo. Um, and here, I think this is Nigeria, uh, you see British guys who aren't in uh, uniform, military uniform, they're in suits. And the people who are uh, the locals of Nigeria are in local dress and are clearly important people. And this is kind of the model that the British hoped for so that they didn't have to take all the heat. They could um, work with local leaders, but still get what they wanted. Um, and you do see here that the uh, Africans are actually in their own you know, normal cultural dress, as opposed to the stuff I showed you about direct rule, which was much more about being brought in and assimilated into European dress and styles. There's another model of that uh, in uh, Rwanda with a Belgian uh, person, and these guys did rule uh, pretty indirectly through uh, Rwanda at times. And here you see kind of the model where you have the Europeans and the, the kind of story of the image here is that the Europeans are helping the local chief. They don't rule him, they don't control through him. That's the PR story, the public relations story. In reality, the Europeans are the people with the power. But you did, if everything worked well in indirect rule, have a believable local ruler who you could use as a puppet. And this is a fairly good example of that. And if everything went perfectly for the Europeans, particularly the British, uh, you would get this kind of thing, where you didn't have to use force to uh, drag materials out of your colonies, your colonies would literally just offer you their own wealth uh, because you were there to help them, bringing them clean water, medicine, this is the symbol for medicine, um, and freeing them from savagery. So this is the kind of PR model that the British saw of themselves, that they were there to help. Um, and as a result, the locals, whichever people in Africa, Asia, or wherever they were ruling, would be happy to donate what they had to the British for the good acts of the British. And I say that intensely ironically in case you can't get that. Another image of indirect rule where you have a local chief and the British sitting there with him um, trying to portray an image of equality, um, although obviously this would be a, a non-equal power relationship.
So if everything went right for the British, um, they could rule through a puppet. And then the best part was that if there were problems, you could, instead of having to use British troops or British force uh, or British reputation, you could turn the locals on each other and therefore uh, blame the problems on somebody else. So if you were oppressive or you didn't deliver stuff uh, that you were supposed to deliver as you know the kind and decent European leaders, you could blame the local puppet leader that you had put in place um, for the problems. And you know if somebody had to like kill the rebels or something like that in a colony, you could have the local chief do it um, and pay him and support him. And often it would be in his interest or the interest of his particular tribe or ethnic group to do that. Um, and therefore the British could always say like, it's not us doing the bad things. It is the locals doing the bad things. Although of course in the background is always British power. And same kind of thing would happen um, in terms of like schools and hospitals and roads and all the other things that the British were supposedly uh, there to help with. Um, unlike in direct rule, where if you don't build a school, you know, you're going to get blamed because you're the people doing everything because that's how direct rule works. In indirect rule, the British could always say like, well, we would love to do it and we're trying to help, but your local leaders are incompetent or haven't asked for it. So basically it just put um, somebody in between the local population that was being ruled and the British power itself. And that local ruler person who is sometimes a puppet um, and sometimes a little tougher than a puppet puppet was put in a really bad situation. Uh, the interesting thing is that this sometimes did develop into a situation where the puppets actually could actually push back against the British, and they did, um, because you did, if you wanted a puppet who was going to work from the British point of view, want someone who the people believed in. And some of those uh, rulers, local rulers, were, were not bad people. Like they took the job because they felt they could do it as well as it could be done. They could get as much out of the British as they could get. And they did push back as hard as they could push back, short of getting taken out of power by the British. And so that kind of often developed into a, a to some extent, productive relationship. Obviously it's not as good as having the Africans rule themselves and you know having a decent time, but um, certainly if you had a leader able to wheedle or threaten or, or, or otherwise get the British to deliver more, that might be helpful. And so I don't mean to say that all of these local rulers at this time under colonialism uh, were bad people, because some of them were actually really trying to help. Um, and the other thing about this is that uh, in this model, you did see a lot of local survival of culture. Um, basically customs and clothing and stuff like you saw in those pictures did survive more under indirect rule than it did under direct rule. Uh, Africans were allowed to build schools that taught in African language in indirect places, uh, indirectly ruled places. And so indirect rule was kind of more sneaky, but it did often have a better outcome for people. It wasn't perfect and certainly independence would have been better, uh, but uh, there's a big difference when your culture being controlled and warped and your culture being destroyed, like might have happened more extremely in, Af in uh, German or French run places. So if you're gonna get conquered, get conquered by the British. Um, and obviously you'd rather not get conquered, but that's kind of how it went. Here's a pretty good image about the more positive vision, uh, later vision, honestly, since it's got radio involved here and clearly this is I believe post-World War II, um, you see uh, basically a, a somewhat more friendly interaction between the Europeans and the local African leaders who were ruling indirectly for the British. Although by this point, um, power was beginning to devolve to African rulers. And so it was actually a little more friendly and a little more um, equal than you might earlier have seen. But generally, this is what the British hoped would happen. The entertaining part is by the time this did happen, the Africans were well on their way to becoming independent. The British did fight that. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, they did eventually leave Africa or were chased out. And I'll leave you with this image, even though it's a bit dishonest. Um, so this kind of, I think, shows the, the goal of indirect rule. The white people are on top and the Africans are fighting each other while Europeans look on. So if indirect rule worked properly, um, in the great dream of Europeans, the Africans would just 
adopt European civilization and everything would get better and you'd still get all their natural resources for cheap. Um, but in reality, what you kind of hoped for was that you could run the place, get the resources out and let the Africans uh, fight amongst themselves as opposed to you having to do the direct rule uh, that went on. Obviously, from the British point of view, hopefully you were helping, but I don't think, especially towards the end, anybody in Britain really believed that, um, or at least the majority of Britons didn't believe that. And certainly nobody in Africa believed that. Um, they wanted independence, and they didn't want to rule, have their puppet rulers have to be puppets. Some of the puppets made the transition and became actual national leaders um, because uh, they were seen as competent and useful. Uh, that happened in some places. And in other places, you would get civil wars and other kinds of nastiness. Um, but certainly indirect versus direct rule was a crucial part of understanding what went differently in Africa. Um, and it had very different outcomes, even though the motive was very similar, which is to get as much out of Africa as you possibly could. Um, and that was what the Europeans wanted. And for the Africans, it was a question of how do we develop uh, a form of resistance capable of pushing these Europeans out of our homelands so that we can become a free and independent people. Um, and so that is the kind of difference and the tricky logic of direct versus indirect rule.